when I became an ethical culture leader, one of the things I learned was this beautiful time. It was sort of like Camelot, and it existed uh, in the mid to late 40s to the early to mid 1990s, and it was called Encampment for Citizenship. And I envy all the students who participated. In the earlier years, they were college students, in later years, they were high school students, and they got together. It was a dream that then leader Algernon Black had, and he shared that dream with former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. And the notion was that at the end of World War II, if we say and if we believe that we have made the world safer for democracy, then it's important that the younger generation know what democracy is. That they not only learn from some wonderful people about what democracy is, but they also need to create it for themselves and experience it during those six weeks that they live together. And so they did. And for a time, they met at Fieldston. And when they did, they came for a weenie roast with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. That was part of that tradition. And then they moved to other places. They moved to the Midwest, uh, to Puerto Rico, to California. And in all of those different places, they lived with people that they had never known before, that they had not even known as individuals, but known as people representing a race, a culture, a social group. When I came here in 2008 and I said, wow, there are more encampers and more alumni around here, we ought to get together and have a reunion. And so in May of 2009, we held a reunion here. We hosted it. And my envy grew deeper <laughs> because I heard their stories. And I heard about people who had never met a Jewish person before were roommates and actually said, may I touch your head because I've been taught that you have horns. Oh. Oh. Native Americans came together from the Midwest and met African Americans. And there had been something they'd grown up with, that they were afraid of African Americans growing up as Native Americans. And they learned to confront that fear and leave that behind. Story after story after story. And it is wonderful. Well, at the end of that reunion, they had a couple of goals. One was to form an alumni association. Another was to find a permanent and safe place for their archives, because some of them had been lost over the years. And another was to resurrect the encampment for another generation of children. They have accomplished all three goals. And here is John Kerner to tell us more about it. Um, and again, son of our beloved Jean Cuthbert. Well, good morning, and again, let me add my thanks to Anne's uh, for coming out on this very cold day that it's we don't have the snow. Of course, I, I work in Toronto, so it's a little warmer to me than perhaps to see you. Um, and my mother, as you, some of you may not know, was a lifelong Canadian never gave up her Canadian citizenship, and I'm a dual citizen of Canada. So, a couple of my friends, Sam Peck, sitting right over there, and I went to this school together, and I don't know if Sam remembers, but this is where we held rhythms class, where boys were in shorts and girls were in leotards, and we would dance around and try and learn to be more rhythmic. Um, <laughs> his wife, Katrin, and I uh, were in Sunday school, and so we often met here, and, uh, I do remember, the last thing I just want to share about this room is that this is where I took my first public speaking class, so I've come full circle. Um, as far as my mother is concerned, uh, she was very active in the ethical culture movement. Um, in fact, that Macintosh, Macintosh is from my mother's apartment, and I was looking at it and saying, that looks awfully familiar to me. So uh, her presence here uh, reminds me of how important she was, and in fact, Anne and I were together back in 2003 for her memorial service that was held down there. And through Anne's efforts and others, um, she's already referenced the memorial terrace, which I'm going to see for the first time.
But most importantly, and most recently, the American Ethical Union established the um, Gene Somerville Kotkin Memorial Fund to help uh, raise scholarship funds for uh, those who were interested in going to camp and couldn't afford to attend. And so this is a program that was very dear to my mother's heart. Um, it meant an enormous, the lived experience of the encampment for me had a profound impact, which I'd like to share with you. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. And uh, just Anne referenced Al Black, who was the co-founder with uh, Alice Pollitzer. Um, one of his quotations about this is, it's one thing to teach about democracy and citizenship. It's another thing to learn by living it. And that was really what the encampment was all about. So, um, as I've already mentioned, I was thoroughly indoctrinated in the ethical culture movement. Sunday school, um, school, the encampment for citizenship. Now, my mother was Scottish Canadian Presbyterian, and my father was also a Canadian but of German Russian heritage. Both were born and met in Montreal. And as I recall, they could agree on very little <laughs> other than giving birth to me. But apparently two other things they did agree upon was that I should be registered as a Canadian born on foreign soil and that the ethical culture schools in the society was where I belonged. So in the circle and friends and families in which I grew up, just one block north of here on 65th Street in Central Park West, I was ensconced in the lower end of the upper middle class. <laughs> In addition to my ethical culture family and friends, many of my friends were from Jewish families. So I attended many bar mitzvahs and a few bat mitzvahs as well. But as for people of color, much of my limited lived experience came from the African American staff my mother and her friends had hired to cook and clean for them, the support staff here at the society and in the elementary school, a few students in our class, at Fieldston and Ethical <coughs> Culture, and the relatively rare African-American and Asian-American teachers that were teaching us at the time. On the other end of the spectrum were the civil rights and political leaders and other celebrities we learned about in school or in Sunday school, we occasionally heard speak right here, and who I sometimes met in person at various fundraising events that I attended with my mother. Of course, I had read about and studied and discuss the issues of segre segregation and civil rights in school. And my mother had per me participate in a number of really interesting civil rights activities. One I particularly recall was from the early 1960s, when there was an effort being made to document the subordinate roles that actors of color had to play on television. So we were given these little pieces of paper, and we were writing down the roles they played on all the television series, trying to document which roles were played by African Americans, which roles were played by Latin Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. Now, I have absolutely no idea what happened to those tally sheets. We handed them in to our parents, and presumably they went somewhere. But I would note that watching television as an action to promote civil rights was pretty easy sledding. Now, when Star Trek premiered in 1966, which had an African-American and an Asian-American as co-stars, wasn't that a big deal for those of us who had spent our time watching television to promote civil rights? In the spring of 1965, I was in ninth grade or third form at the Fieldston School. Fieldston had a reputation of offering a very progressive curriculum. And I don't think many would have argued that the content was not progressive. After all, it was associated with the ethical culture movement. But what was the lived experience like? In, our, in 1965, our class, Sam's class, Katrina's class, my class, was made up of 115 students, of whom four were African American. By 1968, when we graduated, our class had shrunk to 111, of whom three were African American, and now two were Asian American. And of the 106 students who graduated from Fieldston in 1965, two were African American and two were Asian American. Now, based on a quick review of the Ethical Culture Fieldston School website, things have clearly changed, both in terms of the faculty, 
and the student body much more ethnically and culturally diverse. But on the other hand, in a 497-page ethics, Fieldston Ethics Reader, published 20 years after we graduated from Fieldston, there was only one three-page chapter that introduced the moral problem of racism. By any account, the year 1965 in the U.S. was one of upheaval and transformation. In February 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated right here in New York City. In March, the U.S. Justice Department ordered all schools to be segregated, threatening to withhold funds from those that refused to complete integration by the fall of 1967. On Sunday, March 7th, almost 50 years ago, a civil rights march in Selma, Alabama provoked state troopers to violence, which fueled additional demonstrations and a march to Montgomery, the capital of Alabama. On the more positive side, in, Mar in May, Head Start welcomed its first class of children in 1965. And the first teaching took place on college campuses opposing military action in Vietnam. And the first draft card burnings happened at the University of California in Berkeley, the site of my campus. In July 1965, the bill establishing Medicare and Medicaid was signed into law. And in August, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. On Wednesday, August 11, 1965, Marquette Fry, a 21-year-old black man, was arrested for drunk driving on the edge of the Los Angeles Watts neighborhood. The ensuing struggle during his arrest sparked off six days of rioting resulting in 34 deaths, over 1,000 injuries, nearly 4,000 arrests, and the destruction of property valued at $40 million. Now, while I was aware of many of these events from watching television and reading newspapers, prior to the summer of 1965, my lived experience had been sheltered by a school and a religious society that were relatively homogeneous with respect to class and race ethnicity. And from summer trips to camp and friends in Montreal, and summer camps in West Copake, New York, and Cooperstown, New York, the Ethical Culture School Camp. So this was the lived experience I had had prior to boarding a Trailways bus with 20 other New York, New Jersey, and campers on our way to Berkeley, California in the summer of 1965. I was 15 years old. The bus trip took three days and nights. And the most memorable part of that bus trip was the beginning because my mother's Presbyterian propriety overcame her ethical judgment, and she persuaded me to wear a tie and jacket to the Port Authority bus terminal <laughs> to meet and make a good impression on my fellow encampers. <laughs> Needless to say, I stood out, stood out like a bit of a sore thumb in relation to the rest of the crew who were more appropriately wearing jeans and t-shirts for a bus trip across the country. The tie didn't make it out of the Lincoln Park. <laughs> we arrived in Berkeley at Barrington Hall on July 4th. We were assigned three to a room. And as Anne said, the, there was an effort made to assign us roommates who were culturally and socioeconomically as different from us as possible. One of my roommates was a Mexican-American, son of a migrant worker from Downey, California. And another was a young man from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As I was just 15, year old, 15 years old and the second youngest participant in the encampment, almost everyone with whom I lived, studied, and worked was older than I was. My class included teenagers representing 21 states and two from the island nation of Jamaica, one of whose names I've never forgotten, the last Paul Pickersgill, <laughs> which had just gained independence three years earlier in August 1962. Now, the director of our encampment in our Europe work was quoted as saying the following. The program that summer substantiated his belief that young people can live with each other in a condition of unresolved differences and have the ability from, to profit from this exposure to those differences. Above and beyond the workshops, mine was in international politics, and I specialized on Marxist ideology. We had great speakers, and we had incredible field trips. One morning, we rose at 2 a.m. 
got on buses and went to Stockton, California, where we loaded onto trucks with the migrant workers who were being picked up to pick strawberries in the field, and we spent the whole day picking strawberries with migrant workers. We visited the Longshoremen's Union. We visited the drug rehabilitation program at Synanon, some of you may have known that. And in stark contrast, to remind us about the disparities in the United States, we also visited Standard Oil of California. The curriculum and the field chips were further enhanced by what the sometimes endless discussions back in our rooms, because we were all coming from very different places when we had these shared experiences. Our encampment started on July 4th, 1965, and ended on August 14th. Berkeley in the summer of 1965 was a hotbed of protests against the Vietnam War and demonstrations for free speech. In fact, one of our speakers at the encampment was Bettina Athecker, who was one of the leaders of the free speech movement at that time. That summer, I was pretty self-conscious about how different I felt from my fellow encampers. Not only was I the second youngest, but as I said, I came from a very different class structure, a very different educational environment. And yet I learned how to live and learn from these differences. But what I was not aware of at the time was the profound impact that that six weeks would have on my future. Looking back on it now, it seems like it served as a tipping point for me from an intellectual understanding of the issues of the day to a growing concern about the injustice and inequities experienced firsthand by some of my fellow encampers, and a motivation to do more than just talk about it. I have no idea if my family or my friends noticed any difference in me when I returned the following school year. Some of them are here, and I'm really glad they are today. But I know that I felt more self-confident, and I became more politically active in subsequent years. For example, six of us organized a strike in our senior year at Fieldston against the Vietnam War in opposition to the administration of the Fieldston School who wanted to teach it. And all six of us who organized this got letters from the then uh, principal, Spencer Brown, telling our parents that he was going to have to write to our colleges to alert them to what troublemakers we were. Well, let me just say that my mother, who was on the board of the school, set Spencer straight very quickly. And those letters, as those of you who know Gene can imagine. So those letters never went out. I also became much more active in social and community service activities, including two years tutoring students through the Neighborhood Youth Corps, and in later years working for something called the Self-Help and Resource Exchange Food Program, here in New York and later in Washington and in Baltimore. My professional research interests were also profoundly imp impacted by my encampment experience. Prior to graduating from NYU with a PhD in community psychology, I worked as a research assistant at the Vera Institute of Justice evaluating the impact of supported work programs for ex-convicts. I also worked as a research program director at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine studying the impact of day hospitalization versus inpatient care for amputee and stroke patients. In my 35-year cancer control career, covering Memorial Sloan Kettering, Lombardi Cancer Center, Georgetown, the National Cancer Institute, and now the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, I have focused much of my work to improving our understanding of the social determinants of health and trying to develop interventions and tools to integrate the lessons learned from science with the lessons learned from practice and policy to reduce health income inequalities. It's interesting to consider that there's only one letter that distinguishes the word underserved from the word undeserved. And that letter is the letter R, which stands for resources. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane, said Martin. Thus, the encampment experience influenced most of my subsequent professional work with respect to the positions I chose to take and the issues I chose to address. But as if I've grown older, I've gradually, and I've gradually gained some power to actually make a difference, I've also become acutely aware of a conundrum. As power increases, the pressure to preserve one's power rather than to share it also grows. Last Sunday, 
the Reverend Nancy Ladd, the senior minister at the River Road Unitarian, Unitarian Universalist Congregation, where my wife Linda is here today, and I have been members since 2000, delivered a sermon entitled, The Burden and the Blessing. Her sermon deeply moved me, and with her permission, she was, she's kind enough to let me share some of her words with you this morning. As Nancy suggested, power sort of collects around one over time, even for the very best of us. In time, it becomes something to defend. And while a rebel may indeed have little or nothing to lose, the powerful ones find something to fight for, to kill for, or just even tell some little white lies for. Yet power is not inherently bad. It's not power that's dangerous. It's what we do with it and how we encounter it when we find out that we ourselves have plenty of it. Now, like Reverend Led, I've grappled with my profound ambivalence toward my own power. Some of this is circumstance, some of it is cultural. I can tell you that my German, Russian, Jewish, Scottish, Canadian, Presbyterian heritage <laughs> can make for a killing combination of Jewish guilt and the Calvinist work ethic. <laughs> it's sometimes a pretty difficult combination with which to deal. Just ask my wife, Linda. But I've also come to realize that power is not supposed to be comfortable. And in some ways, my encampment experience set the foundation for my coming to this realization. Leadership is not supposed to be simple. As Frederick Doug Douglass stated, power concedes nothing without demand. It never did and it never will. Which means some of us have to be powerful enough to step up and demand equality and demand justice. So, doing social justice work in this time, in this place, is inherently an uncomfortable encounter with great power. This is true for both the powers of injustice we try to address and the powers for change we inherently possess. Responses to the realization of our own power may be to simply protect it or become afraid of it and run away from it. <coughs> or to use it for a moral purpose. Thus, the consolidation of our power is not for its continued existence in whatever kingdoms we might rule now or in the future, but rather it's for the service of people and ideals worth defending. From my perspective, this is one of the aspirational goals of the lived experience of the youth who attend the encampment for citizenship. We achieve this by learning from discomfort, that we feel when being confronted and coming to appreciate, but not necessarily agreeing with, the views of peers and counselors who've experienced the world very differently from the way we've experienced it. How different our worlds were 50 years ago, and how different they are today. This was really recently brought home to me in the top, top, two top of the fold stories from the Sunday, February 8th New York Times. You may have seen them. The first was, Hidden wealth flows to elite New York condos, the billionaire's haven. And the second was, economic plan is a quandary for Clinton 16, how to address anger over the wealth gap. So when one reviews the literature on social determinants of health, the former director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer commented, it's rather depressing to encounter the same observations the same results and the same conclusions over the years. Although there is not much to be found that is new, poverty continues to be rediscovered, mortality is higher, survival rates of cancer patients are lower, and life expectancy is shorter comparing with socioeconomically less and more favored populations. In Canada, the Inuit, think Alaska Natives, have a 13-year lower life expectancy than the average Canadian, 13 years. And in the United States, African American males have the lowest life expectancy of all racial, ethnic, and gender groups, about five years lower than all males. And what about the life expectancy of African American males in America when public and private authorities confront them with suspicion and fear in difficult circumstances? In 2014, 13 African American males died at the hands of police authorities in this country. Several of them are here, right here in New York City. In fact, since the year 2000, 60 African-American males have died in America 
as a result of confrontations with those in our communities who have chosen as their life work to serve and protect us. 13 and 2014. Power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love, said Martin Luther King. On March 7th, my wife Linda and I and several other members of our congregation will be going down to Selma and to Birmingham to celebrate the 50th and commemorate the 50th anniversary of that profound march. And some of you may not know this, but your leader emeritus, Corin Norwegian, was in that 50 years ago when he was a Unitarian minister from Sarasota, Florida. While ho hopefully nothing will happen at this march as did 50 years ago, when Linda suggested to me that we go on this trip to bear witness on how far we've come and how much farther we have to go, I saw this as a great opportunity to reconnect with my youthful days of social justice action at the encampment. This, is, this opportunity has rekindled me the hopes and aspirations to which I was exposed and internalized 50 years ago. And as Anne said recently, the encampment has restarted. So effective social change, powerful witness, risky leadership. This is the burden and the blessing of this calling that our Reverend Ladd reminded us of. Power properly understood is nothing but the ability to achieve purpose, said Martin Luther King. Which brings me finally to what the purpose of my visit with you today. First, I'd like to ask each of you to search within yourselves, individually and collectively as a congregation, to explore what power you may have and what more power you may be able to get to affect social change. Second, I'd like to ask you to pick up the materials in the back there about the encampment for citizenship. Take a look at them. And I'm asking you to do this because we really like your advice and your recommendation for young teenagers who you may, maybe in your family or extended family, friends and family, who you would suggest could benefit from the same experience I have and so many other encampers have had. Because we want as diverse a population of encampers as possible. And then finally, and this can't be left behind, I'd like you to consider donating the Encampment for Citizenship. There's lots of ways to do it. The New York Society for Ethical Culture and the American Ethical Union have created the Encampment for Citizenship Scholarship Fund, which is one way you can do it. You can also choose to do what Linda and I have done, and for the past two years we've donated one full scholarship to the Encampment to make sure that someone in need could participate in that program. On February 26, 1965, an Alabama state trooper shot and killed Jimmy Lee Jackson, a 26-year-old black civil rights worker. This killing set in motion the chain of events that led to the demonstrations at Selma and the march from Mon Selma to Montgomery for voting rights for all Americans, not just the worried, white, wealthy, and well. So, as we think about this day, 50 years later, our nation is still confronting violence towards and social injustice for African Americans, as well as the ideological opposition to sharing the promise and prosperity of America for all who come to find a better life here and want to contribute to our collective well-being. Be the change you wish to see in the world, said Mahatma. Let's help each other and future generations to be that change. Thank you very much.